Content warning. Don't watch this at work. Discussion of unionizing, ableism, eugenics, medical anxiety, death, suicide, depression, trauma, and mental health. Yeah, this is not going to be monetized. COVID denialism. How disabled people wish you were talking about the pandemic. Hello, everyone. At the risk of making this video even longer than it already is, I wanted to get the main idea out of the way right here. We should still be taking COVID seriously. Much, much more seriously than we currently are. I see too many people normalizing and downplaying the pandemic in a similar way that we've normalized and downplayed climate change. It's normal to respond like this to mortal threats, like the very real threat of death or permanent disability that we face every day, now more than usual. If we spent every moment of every day reflecting upon our inevitable deaths, it would be kind of hard to get much of anything done. But let's be clear. This denial in the context of COVID will lead to millions of preventable deaths and millions of people being permanently disabled. And really, it already has. The goal is not to go back to normal. We can't go back to normal. Normal was never working. We need to learn some hard lessons and move forward. To quote from a piece about climate denial by Arnold Schroeder, finding a path through the fire means perceiving the fire with reverence, even as it threatens us with destruction, even as we give aid to those who have been displaced by it and grieve for those who have died. We cannot keep ignoring the fire that is COVID. We cannot keep disregarding the apocalyptic images of freezer trucks full of bodies, hospitals filled to capacity, and people becoming permanently disabled by what is being called a mild variant. <laughs> not taking precautions now will not only doom high-risk people to isolation that's likely to last the rest of their lives, but also create more high-risk people who will also have to be indefinitely isolated. We need to set up protocols and mitigate the damage so everything that's happened with Omicron doesn't happen again for the next wave, which may be even deadlier. Healing and action are not mutually exclusive. We can, and must, do both. We all want to go back to regular in-person gatherings and big events, but we can't. Not right now. Most of our population catching a potentially deadly and permanently disabling virus is not normal, acceptable, or inevitable. Got it? Okay. Now let's discuss how to proceed from there. Oh, and feel free to skip around to whatever sections you're interested in. This is a long one, so if I'm getting too rambly, just go on and skip ahead. Most of these sections are about possible ways to respond to talking points, so if you want to get right to that, then just go ahead. Who should we be mad at? Being a disabled person during a pandemic is going to be my villain origin story, says this tweet that I could not agree with more. Everything's stacked against us. And you know who's being blamed for it? We are. The people, I mean. As opposed to the way the American economy and culture is arranged for the promotion of eugenics. Possibly I just lost several viewers there. Let me expand on that. How often do you hear people complain about the unvaccinated? A lot, I'd imagine. Now how often do you hear people complain about how it costs thousands of dollars and several years out of your life to become a doctor? Our neoliberal care systems are arranged in a way that, one, limits how many people can enter these professions, two, incentivizes hospitals to hire as few medical professionals as absolutely necessary in order to cut costs, and three, actively punishes those who need access to care with insurmountable debt, or, at best, loss of income. I'm pissed off at unvaccinated people too, don't get me wrong, but it's an individual solution to a deep systemic problem. And what if we didn't have a vaccine? Who would we be mad at then? To maximize profits, American hospitals have been intentionally understaffing nurses for decades, long before the pandemic. What the hospital industry doesn't want you to know is that there's never been more licensed nurses in America. Hospitals just aren't hiring them. Public health measures, in particular, will inevitably fail or at least be weakened in every capitalist country, no matter how much people claim to value them. It's one of the fatal anti-human flaws of capitalism. That's not saying other capitalist countries have done nearly as bad a job as the United States, 
but they all have to actively work against the interests of the economy in order to provide care. The United States is simply unwilling to do this at all. Remember when the pandemic started and old people were going on Fox News and telling other old people that they should be willing to literally die for the sake of our economy? See this some more news video for more details on how specifically the U.S. failed, like how we ran out of body bags and brought back child labor. Even in countries where healthcare is socialized, they're still working within the bounds of neoliberal austerity measures. See this video by John the Duncan for more of that perspective. Basically, they're not going to hire or train any more doctors than absolutely necessary, they're not going to approve any more procedures or meds than what's necessary, they're going to constantly be trying to figure out ways to cut costs and sacrifice care in order to continue cutting taxes to the corporations who both financially support political campaigns and threaten to leave the country and take jobs away with every tiny hypothetical fraction of a percent that their taxes could be raised, hypothetically. You can make arguments about how worker productivity is increased with access to health care and how it's actually better for the economy in the long run to have social programs. But when you prioritize short-term gains over long-term stability, when workers are systematically denied collective bargaining power, when corporations can threaten to impoverish hundreds of thousands of people on a whim, when there's always a reserve army of labor willing to work in sweatshops for pennies, then worker health and the deaths of millions will never even be factors when calculating the cost of business. And we've now seen how this is literally true. Yes, it's natural to be mad at anti-maskers, conspiracy theorists, and people otherwise denying or downplaying the pandemic. But that anger isn't productive. Changing millions of individual people's minds without changing any of the forces that led them into and continue to support these harmful beliefs isn't a long-term workable strategy. There's no way these minds can change for good if there's no material support for doing the right thing. Shift your anger from individuals to the economic system that forces these people to do unnecessary labor and risk everyone's lives and physical well-being in times of crisis. Shift your anger to the media, which acts only in the interests of this system and has consistently, at best, downplayed the pandemic and, at worst, intentionally miseducated and propagandized to vulnerable populations in order to garner support for corporate politicians or sell their audience fake cures. Shift your anger to the government, which exists to protect the owning class at the expense of millions of lives. Shift your anger to the politicians and employers who refuse to freeze rent, offer job protections, provide economic support, provide universal health care, or do literally anything that could make quarantine a viable choice for the average person living paycheck to paycheck. How are you supposed to protect people over profit when everything you've ever known incentivizes you to do just the opposite? I try to be empathetic and understand that Individual anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers have been exposed to so much propaganda and miseducation that they just have no concept of reality anymore. They aren't the bad guys. They're not evil. They're just misled. Aside from the outright lies they've been told about the safety of vaccines compared to the safety of a disease that has killed over 5 million people globally, they think we live in a world of a fourth grader's misunderstanding of Darwinism where it's adapt or perish, and if people don't survive, then that's because they aren't morally or cosmically good enough. A really depressing mindset, I'd say. Some days, when I'm not thinking about how they're actively killing us, I feel really sad for anti-vax and anti-mask people. We really need to get better at teaching science and natural selection in schools and in our media, but that's a topic for a different video. Oh, and also, we should be angry at employers who apparently could have been providing us all with work-from-home accommodations this whole fucking time. If I had a nickel for every disabled person who was asked to work from home prior to the pandemic and was told it was impossible, and then had to watch abled people get all these simple accommodations they asked for in mere days, well, I'd, I'd have a shitload of nickels. Like, just an obscene amount. An un manageable amount of nickels. What do we want? We want the same thing as anyone else. 
to live and be able to exist in public spaces safely. In order to achieve this, we need the endemic prevalence of COVID to be reduced to a reasonable amount of risk. Unlike climate change, there are real and useful precautions individual people can take to significantly reduce the damage of COVID. Getting vaccinated, wearing masks, testing, and quarantining. But we need to incentivize people to take these precautions, or at least not actively punish them for doing so. I'm not going to pretend like I have perfect solutions here. I don't speak for the entire disability community. And I'm obviously more than open to suggestions in the form of comments, tweets, emails, discord, messages, carrier pigeon, musical telegram, whatever you've got. The truth is, COVID is going to be really difficult to eradicate. Experts estimate it'll take decades at this point. Similar to eradicating polio. It's not impossible, but it's best to accept that we have to go on living with some amount of risk for a very long time. Additionally, there could be another health crisis at any moment, and we have done nothing, structurally, to prevent it from being as deadly and disabling as COVID. So what can be done to make this crisis, and other near-future crises, suck less? Generally, any way we can reduce the power of the owning class will be productive. But here's some jumping-off points. Free and accessible PPE, universal health care, two weeks minimum paid sick leave, debt forgiveness, and housing for all, or at minimum, suspension of rent, utility, loan, and mortgage payments, and suspension of arrests of unhoused people during outbreaks, and always, but we can settle for just during outbreaks. I've included a list of rent strike resources in the resource document. Pandemic wages, virtual schooling options, free child care options, free higher education, in order to remove barriers and train more healthcare workers. And, of course, additional protections for marginalized communities, ideally with the goal of deinstitutionalization and an at home care model. I don't want to review the horrors that have taken place in prisons, nursing homes, psychiatric facilities, ICE detention camps, and other institutionalized living facilities. People living in medical institutions make up less than 1% of the US population. But, According to this article published in June 2020, they were nearly 50% of COVID-19 deaths at that time. Efforts need to be made to increase global vaccination rates, mask distribution, and education about how to protect your community. Looking at this issue on a global scale is kind of too much for this video, but just remember, we have global markets. No one is safe until all of us are safe. And if you're looking at any of this and wondering, oh, but where will we get the money? Look up our defense budget. Look up what percent of income Jeff Bezos paid in taxes. I think one of the wealthiest nations on Earth can find the money somewhere. But what can I do? Again, feel free to add your suggestions and resources. I have a resource document in the description, and I can add your information there. Some good places to start might be mutual aid and dual power building. For more immediate results than asking the government, pretty please, can we have some PPE so I don't kill my grandma? I'd suggest creating and participating in mutual aid and dual power building projects. If you have resources to share, share them. If you're in need, ask. Set up food banks, clothing drives, free stores, public gardens, community care centers, and don't wait around to ask for permission. Collectively, we can build communities of care, which can and do distribute resources from each according to their abilities and to each according to their needs. Watch this video for an overview on mutual aid, including how to distinguish between mutual aid and charities. Here's some online mutual aid funds you can donate to or apply for, and some other resources for building your own communities. Workplace organizing. Workers have more power now than they've had in decades due to massive labor shortages and what seems to be an overall hesitancy among younger generations to literally risk their lives for unnecessary labor. What's being called the Great Resignation is demonstrably helping to raise wages across the nation. Keep quitting low-paying jobs. Keep organizing your workplaces. Refuse to be paid less than a living wage. The CDC lowered quarantine recommendations from 10 to 5 days due to corporate pressure, implying that businesses can't even handle a full 10 days without just a few employees. This is clearly unsustainable, but great news for work strikes. 
Businesses need to be pressured into treating workers like human beings. Push your employers to enact COVID-safe policies like work-from-home accommodations, mandatory mask wearing, hand sanitizer, paid sick leave, mandatory frequent testing and or vaccines, health care, and living wages, so employees can actually afford to be housed and shelter in place if necessary. The more we empower workers and promote collective action, the more we incentivize community care. I've provided some helpful resources for getting started on organizing efforts in the description below. Here's a good video if you're just introducing people to these ideas in the context of COVID. And here's an important video which discusses how unions have too often been pro-war. Be careful your organizing efforts are not divorced from an anti-imperialist framework. Strikes and protests. Rent strikes, work strikes, even letter-writing campaigns, petitions, social media posts, and op-eds. Now is the time to refuse to put up with bullshit and be as loud as possible about it. If possible, try to get ahead of the bullshit. It's always better to play offense. And do what you can to make your demands heard by people who can enact material change. Obviously, no mutual aid project or union has the power of the current federal government. If you can help people right now via passing specific legislation, then go for it. I mean, four free tests per household isn't enough, but it's more than zero. 400 million free disposable masks for a population of 329 million isn't enough, but it's more than zero. If it helps, do it. Talking to people. That all being said, mobilizing is obviously ill-advised during a pandemic. Much of what we can focus on right now is formulating shared material goals and having conversations in order to refine our ideas and convince others of the importance of these goals. Remember that Occupy Wall Street happened three years after the financial crash. Let's let the pandemic be a similarly motivating event. Make videos, make memes, write blog posts, have one-on-one -on -one conversations, keep tweeting and Facebooking and tick-talking. Do whatever you can to be visible and debunk or ideally get ahead of misinformation. It's essential to get individual people to take this pandemic seriously again, shielding and wearing masks and vaccinated. And, of course, we need them to support measures that would make these things easier for the average person to do. I'm going to do an overview of some common talking points and misunderstandings that I see regularly, and I hope what I say can help you reach people where they're at and educate them. I marked off the sections, so feel free to skip around. There are plenty of people hovering in a space of soft denial and vaccine anxiety who could potentially be convinced to isolate, vaccinate, and maybe even support work protest movements or government support measures, other than, or in addition to, vaccine and testing mandates. It's all about harm reduction at this point. There are no perfect solutions. I'm not going to bother with how to handle people who think COVID isn't real or other deep state conspiracy theories like that. Here's a video on how to talk to people who are into conspiracies if you want to try and dive down that rabbit hole with someone. Good luck. These are soft denial talking points I see from average people and in the mainstream media. You might even hold some of these biases and misconceptions yourself. Oh, and disabled people, I know you're tired, and I know these conversations are hard. You should take what time you need to take care of your own mental health, but... Try and channel some of your healing through organizing like I'm trying to do with this video. I'm really hoping this video can help ease some of your emotional labor. It's incredibly frustrating and draining to feel like you have to display superhuman levels of patience and empathy on the off chance someone will listen to you, while largely being dismissed and fearing for your life. Abled people, we need you to start picking up the slack. This video has honestly been the hardest one I've made so far because of the real, imminent threat of this virus to the lives of people I care about. And because it's so f***ing long. Alright, before we start, let's do some basic tips for talking to people. Again, you can skip this section if you just want the talking points. Discuss. Don't debate. The purpose of these conversations is to push people towards taking precautions and supporting collective action. Not to convince them to support science or agree with everything you believe. That would be a totally different discussion. <laughs> and this is a discussion, not a debate. You're sharing ideas, not trying to win an argument. Here are some general guidelines that apply to pretty much any discussion over potentially contentious subjects. They're loosely based on the practice of motivational interviewing. 
listen to them, and try not to get too bogged down in details. Psychologists find that when we listen carefully and call attention to the nuances in people's own thinking, they become less extreme and more open in their views. Try to find the crux of their argument and the origin of their beliefs in your disagreement. Few people change their entire way of life based on a couple of studies they read about in unspecified horse medicine. These people are primed to believe these studies for other reasons. Find those reasons. Do you have different conceptions of reality or human nature, different definitions of terms, different personal values, different policy ideas? Find the most basic level where you differ and work from there. Validate their feelings and observations. For instance, someone may be complaining about Big Pharma. They may hesitate to trust the CDC because of their financial interests. This is 100% reasonable. In this case, you yes and them. They say, they're all just out for money. And you say, yes, and I can't believe they shorten quarantine times due to pressure from corporate interests. They're compromising people's safety and putting profit over human lives. You're right. It's ridiculous. Tailor your conversation to your audience. If you're talking to a Christian, and you're also Christian and know relevant Bible verses, use it. If you're talking to a marginalized person who, understandably, hesitates to trust vaccines due to their community's history of being experimented upon, then that's a different conversation than one with a person who maybe personally experienced medical trauma or is simply anti-science. And remember that people all think differently. What's convincing to you might be meaningless to someone else. Don't use jargon. Unless you're talking to a socialist, don't use terms like reserve army of labor or dialectical materialism or even internalized ableism. Just talk like a regular person. You're building an empathetic connection with someone, not trying to impress them with big words. You're their peer, not an authority figure. Use experience, not studies. Explain why you personally believe the things you do, and try to notice what things personally affect whoever you're talking to. Whenever possible, talk about your values and your experience, not studies. Of course, if you're talking to someone who trusts science but just isn't taking the pandemic seriously, then go ahead and use some studies. See my point about tailoring your conversation. Don't insist on perfection. For instance, tell them you're not so concerned about the vaccine if they take other precautions very seriously. The point is for them to understand the gravity of the situation better. If you can convince an anti-masker to wear a mask or an anti-vaxxer to test frequently in quarantine, then those are small wins that are reducing the spread. Any amount of progress should be celebrated. Be informed, but don't hide points of ignorance. Tell them you'll do research and get back to them if you aren't familiar with something they say. Send links and resources when possible, but Ultimately, people who are not vaccinated are clearly not making their decisions based on science. This is about building trust. Give them reasons to trust you. And actually be open to expanding your perspective. They probably do know some things you don't. Maybe not about science or politics, but maybe about religion or art or engineering. People all have their areas of expertise. Respect that. Plus, this way they'll feel more free to admit their own points of ignorance as the discussion progresses. Ask open-ended questions. Asking open-ended questions is important not only to show people that you respect them and you wish to have a discussion, but also to figure out how to tailor that discussion in a productive way. For instance, a good way to open these discussions might be to ask them how they think we should have handled the pandemic and then walk them through their own action plan. Be compassionate. Assume ignorance not malice. Always assume this person who disagrees with you is trying their best to be a good person no matter how much it seems obvious that their choices are actively harming others. Don't waste your time. That being said, if you find that your entire conception of reality fundamentally differs from another person, or that someone is asking bad faith questions, or is particularly combative, then it's not really worth it to dump your energy into talking to them. Know when to move on. Disagree privately. If a friend posts something on social media that's false and or dangerous, then you should message them about it directly. Don't leave a comment and embarrass them in front of everyone. If they don't take it down or amend it, or if, God forbid, they post screenshots of your conversation, then sure, yeah, comment publicly then to combat the spread of misinformation. Get some of your other friends to comment publicly. They have insisted on spectacle, 
So you can choose to participate in that and hope that being visible is enough to legitimize your position to outside observers. But know that this is what you're doing. You're not changing anyone's mind that you're speaking to directly. You're no longer talking to your friend. You're talking to your friend's public persona. Always message people privately when possible. Or, better yet, call or message them off the platform entirely. Reduce the spectacle of debate and make things personal and real whenever possible. Set an example publicly. Or as publicly as possible. Sometimes that means as an anonymous person on the internet, sometimes that means on your own Facebook page with your own face attached. Be a kind person in your everyday life, post about your hobbies and interests, and be unapologetic about your beliefs and convictions. To do so is to take a lot of the stigma and fear away from the words like socialist, communist, or anarchist. That's how we Americans came to be so accepting of fascist rhetoric. It's not so threatening anymore when grandma recites the 14 words. Try and get ahead of misinformation whenever possible. Of course, I understand many people are in positions where they're dependent upon people who may withdraw support if they express too much dissent. In which case, stick to private and anonymous conversations. Do what you can. Don't hurt yourself or your important relationships. This may be based on my own experience, but I find it much more productive, less likely to devolve into an argument, and less likely to be personally anxiety-inducing if I engage in in-depth political disagreements with people I'm not living with, in complicated relationships with, or otherwise dependent upon. That's not to say I never speak up around my family when something's important to me. I definitely do that. Maybe too much at the cost of my own mental health. I'm just saying there's a lot more emotional labor you put into a disagreement with a parent than with a casual friend, or even like five casual friends and you have to know where to put your energy. There are, of course, some people that it's better to totally cut out of your life, but some people, for some issues, we have to realistically assess if it's worth the relationship strain on a case-by-case basis. When it's clear someone you're close to is not someone who can change their mind, don't engage more than necessary, and instead focus your efforts elsewhere. Get the timing right. When you sense too much tension, pull back and de-escalate. Before starting conversations like this, assess where the person you're talking to is at, emotionally, and assess where your relationship is at. Maybe they just had a terrible day and they need to talk about that. Maybe you're kind of mad at them for something else, or they're mad at you and you're at risk of picking a fight. In those cases, you should delay the conversation to a better time. Treat them like a whole human being, not as a bunch of individual beliefs you don't agree with. Alright, this first section about masks expands a little on the first point about identifying points of contention. So here we go. Time to own some libs. I'm kidding. Don't. Let me reiterate, you should not try and own anyone. Okay, here we go. If you wear your mask all day, then you're breathing in your own germs. So, obviously masks don't work like that at all. Saying that it's unsafe to wear a mask because you're breathing in your own germs is like saying it's unsafe to swallow your own saliva and should instead be swallowing other people's saliva. You're inhaling air regardless. It's clearly better for this air to have fewer foreign germs. This isn't even to mention all the scientific evidence supporting mask wearing. Arguments like these against masks, and many against lockdowns and vaccines as well, don't come from logic or evidence, as we can clearly see here. These arguments instead come from what's termed motivated inference. Motivated inference is the idea that people tend to evaluate causal theories based not just on the evidence, but also on their own personal goals. In regular language, that means people are more likely to believe anything that tells them what they already want to hear. Social science is often about making up terms to describe things that are already kind of common sense. Pretty much all of our beliefs come from some amount of motivated inference. This isn't unique to anti-maskers. What is logically incoherent to one person is completely emotionally coherent to another. And that's not always a bad thing. People who decide that masks are useless or dangerous are people who've aligned mask wearing with some larger goal or value. For example, freedom, masculinity, support for Trump, or support for the economy. Telling them that mask wearing does work, actually, without aligning this information with one of those larger emotional goals will mean this information just drops right out of their brains. Kind of like whenever I try to learn anything about astrology or the stock market. So how do we get people to change their beliefs if statistics don't work? 
A UCLA study found that showing anti-vaxxers the horrific effects of measles on the body is far more convincing than simply presenting them with evidence. That might seem kind of extreme, but unfortunately fear campaigns are successful, and there's a lot we should be afraid of in the context of COVID. I'll link to some videos in the resources document which fall into this category if you want to work on some agitprop, but I'm not going to show those here. Thankfully, showing people short educational videos like this, and providing them with analogies and metaphors and visual representations of abstract ideas, also helps tap into this emotional decision-making process. So these things are also useful, and less horrible to look at. In conversation, it's best to ask people to explain these beliefs. Guide them to think critically, look for points of ambivalence, affirm their concerns, and reinforce their own autonomy. Ask open-ended critical thinking questions like, what are all the possible pros and cons of wearing a mask? I know it's hard, but you have to put some faith in people. And you can even try and look at it as a growth exercise for yourself. If you get onto the topic of masks and freedom, tell them you're also worried about the establishment of an authoritarian dictatorship. Who wouldn't be? But you want to know how exactly mask wearing is a significant step towards this. They'll likely say communism or socialism when they mean authoritarianism. Just ignore that, replace it with what they actually mean. If they try to shift away from the personal decision to wear masks and into mask mandates, shift the conversation back. Or tell them we already have a system in place by which the government enforces the law and you don't see how adding a law about masks would necessarily expand the system in any significant way. Like biometric passports, for instance, might. Ask if there are ways wearing masks might actually contribute to their goal of freedom if we were to assume that they work. Now what are the risks of assuming they don't work? Walk them through a cost-benefits analysis. Be sure to tell them that, no matter their decision, you respect that they're going to do whatever they feel is best for themselves and their community. Saying this takes away much of the knee-jerk reaction most people have to being faced with information which contradicts them the feeling of being demonized, and instead acts as an invitation into a discussion on community care. At no point should you forget that the person you're talking to truly is trying to do what they think is best for themselves and their community, based on the information they have available and the way they see the pandemic. You're almost certainly not talking to an evil or malicious person. Don't treat them like they are. Well, you can wear a mask if that makes you feel better. You'll be protected. But that doesn't mean everyone has to. There are very good masks, but none of them can offer 100% protection. But let's pretend like they do, even though they don't. If, for example, I were a teacher with an autoimmune disorder, and my entire classroom was unmasked, or even just half-masked, then this would mean I could not take my mask down for even a second the entire time I was in a school building. The transmissibility of this strain of COVID is such that it lingers in the air for hours in spaces that aren't well ventilated, like most classrooms. Even a brief moment of unmasked exposure, as brief as a few seconds, is enough to catch the virus. And there have been cases of people catching COVID from an indirect exposure of this sort. There's no five-second rule with COVID. So even if a mask were a 100% bulletproof barrier against COVID, which it's not, this means no taking the mask off at all. No drinking water, no eating food, no adjusting the mask if it starts to slip. In order to do any of these things, this immune-compromised teacher would have to find a place outside and away from any humans, which means immune-compromised people are expected to leave their workplace entirely whenever they need to drink water or eat or do any normal human thing that requires taking their mask off, even very briefly. Not sure if you know this, but people are generally expected to stay in their workplaces for six to eight hours every day with maybe a 30-minute break for lunch. Leaving children unsupervised or leaving your work unattended while you run outside is generally frowned upon. If everyone wears masks, then it's reasonably safe to occasionally take the mask down for a brief moment in order to sip water, which is necessary for all human life, or to readjust it which is simply a normal thing that needs to be done every so often. Even if masks were a perfect barrier, other people still need to mask to reduce the amount of COVID in the air because it's just not possible or reasonable to expect every person to never have to adjust the mask or drink water for six to eight hours every day at work. I don't really trust it. 
Do you know all the chemicals in that? My cousin's friend's ball sack. It's normal to be hesitant about putting a foreign substance into your body. I get it. That's why I don't want to catch COVID, which is also a foreign substance. So what exactly is your definition of unnatural? Why do you think it would be better to catch COVID? If you don't think it's likely you'll catch COVID, what precautions are you taking? I'll link to some more comprehensive vaccine videos in my resources document, but I'll outline some general arguments and analogies here. If they aren't vaccinated, but are shielding in place and wearing masks, then I'd probably move on to talking with them about direct action and making it easier for others to do the same. I'm more focused on getting people to take the pandemic seriously than vaccines specifically. It's obviously best if they vaccinate, but it's currently more important that they shield during this wave and others, since you can still pass on Omicron even with the vaccine. You aren't a virologist. Well, maybe you are. I don't know your life. I'm not a virologist. So I'd be honest that I don't fully understand how the vaccine works either, but I do see that it's worked for people, and I'd explain how I weighed my options. I'd just state my experience and leave it for a later conversation once it's safer to leave home. When you think they're ready for the vaccination conversation, ask them, are there contexts where you do trust medicine? For instance, if you break your leg, are you going to go to a hospital and have it set in a splint? If your leg requires surgery, are you going to allow the doctors to operate? Most people, in an emergency, trust the doctors know what they're doing. So why don't you see this pandemic as an emergency? C-section, only the disabled are dying for what will almost definitely be their response. Vaccinated people are still getting it. 95% of the people who are dying are unvaccinated. Just because you can still catch this mutated strain of COVID doesn't mean the vaccines aren't working. It just means they'll be less and less effective with each new variant, a thing virologists already knew and warned us about. See my sections on mutations. As a side note, I am pissed at the CDC for not emphasizing mutations or the risk of post-viral conditions in their messaging. This 95% statistic will not be convincing for more conservative, unvaccinated people. I know, it's very confusing. But more conservative thinkers tend to struggle with the concept of harm reduction in general. This holds true for drugs, guns, sex education, and now infectious disease. This stems from a general propensity towards high systems justification. That is, trust in our current institutions. And let me clarify that I'm not just talking about Republicans when I say conservative here. Democrats who voted for Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders also score high in general systems justification. Republicans who voted for Trump actually score lower in general systems justification, but high on gender and economic systems justification. This is likely due to their regressive rather than conservative beliefs. That is, make America great again implies that America is not great right now, but was in some mythic past. Anyway, the logic is, if America is already the best, or was in the past, and we have always had at least X number of gun deaths per year, then there's either no possible way to reduce that number, or if we do reduce that number, then we make America worse, because it's already the best. So, if America is the best, or has been in the past, and I have X percent risk of catching COVID and dying, then there's either no possible way to reduce that number, that number is fake, or if we do strange new things to reduce that number, then we make America worse, because it's already the best, or it was the best at some mythic other time when we did not do those strange new things. So this makes reasoning with them very difficult, to say the least, because it takes statistics off the table. Unfortunately, the vaccine, and mask wearing, has already become wrapped up in their political identity, so separating it from their identity as an American would be a tricky thing to do. You can attempt to appeal to other values they hold, and demonstrate that the vaccine supports these values. Try to find the nuance in their beliefs by asking things like, do you think there are any situations where a person should get a vaccine? Do you think there have been any vaccines that have been good? 
If they're conservative or regressive, then you might have another option. You can try and make vaccines seem American and therefore good. And it seems like Trump is currently trying to do this, but he hasn't had much luck. And I'm not exactly sure how to do this. You could talk about the history of vaccines, like how Washington inoculated his troops against smallpox, stating, quote, Necessity not only authorizes, but seems to require the measure. Maybe talk about the Spanish flu and how people wore masks then. Make it clear that masks and vaccinations have always been part of your duty as an American to protect your country. Who knows if that convinces anyone, but it's worth a shot. A shot. Ha. But my cousin's uncle's stepbrother got the vaccine, and then three months later, he died from a heart attack. Heart condition issues are far, far more prevalent with people who actually contract COVID than with people who get the vaccine. 95% of people dying are unvaccinated. An estimated 10 to 30% of all people who contract COVID will go on to have long COVID, a condition which often affects your heart. Your risk of death by any cause in the six months following a COVID infection increases by 60%. As of writing this, there have been over 324 million COVID cases globally, and 65 million in the U.S. If just 10% of those people get long COVID, the lowest estimate of people who will get long COVID, then that's over 32,400,000 cases globally, and 6.5 million in the U.S. alone. And that's the most optimistic estimate. In comparison... There are more side effects from taking aspirin or Tylenol than from the vaccine. But don't say that. Don't, don't quote statistics at a person who's skeptical of science. It, that's a reflex. Ask things like, why do you think it was the vaccine that caused him to die? And do you think his chances would have been better had he caught COVID instead? You know, it, it might not have been the vaccine that caused your cousin's uncle's stepbrother to die. Sometimes people just die. And sometimes that happens to correspond with another thing they did that's unrelated. If I poked a million people on the forehead over the course of a day, somehow, then statistically, at least one of those people will be dead by the end of the week. Was it because I poked their forehead? Or was it because they just died? People who make medicine and vaccines understand this risk of unrelated death or disease. That's why we have the entire field of statistical analysis to determine whether or not the number of people dying or presenting with certain symptoms is statistically significant and a cause for concern, or just a normal amount of death to be expected in the target population. Of course, there are some people for whom the vaccine is not recommended. And this is even more of a reason to get the vaccine, if you're able, in order to protect this population. Some people are allergic to the ingredients. Some people have under or overactive immune systems. There are any number of medical reasons why a person can't get this vaccine or why they wouldn't produce antibodies even if they did. But these conditions pretty rarely exist undetected in the people who have them. And if you are concerned that you may medically not be a candidate for the vaccine, then that's a legitimate concern to take to a medical professional who can evaluate you. The vaccine isn't a perfect solution because there are no perfect solutions, only harm reduction measures. The ideal perfect fantasy course of action is for people to simply not ever be exposed to any amount of COVID at all via the virus or the vaccine. But that's obviously impossible, especially now that we've let it ravage our entire population. The next best course of action that exists in this realm of reality is for as many people as possible to social distance and vaccinate and otherwise reduce the risk of passing COVID around. A lot of this vaccine fear seems to come from anecdotal evidence on social media. I've seen a couple of videos circulating around of people presenting with various neurological symptoms claiming that it happened after the vaccine, but even if we assume these are real, it's highly statistically unlikely that this would happen to you or anyone you know. Like I said, it's less dangerous than aspirin. And how many people do you know that have died taking aspirin? Try, if you can, to educate people on how to spot anecdotal evidence. Or fight fire with fire and tell them a horrible story about someone you personally know 
who contracted COVID and follow the dialogue tree accordingly. I think at this point, we pretty much all have these stories, unfortunately. In August, the guy I dated for three years in high school, the first person I loved, died from COVID at only 31 years old because he was unvaccinated. After he died, I was talking to one of our old friends who, turns out, is anti-vax, and he said my ex had arthritis and drank too much coffee, and that's probably how he died, because he drank too much coffee. My ex was a nurse who worked 12-hour shifts on his feet all day. He was as healthy as any average 31-year-old. Underlying conditions are irrelevant. Nearly everyone has at least one underlying condition. Over 95% of the world's population has at least one medicalized condition. See my section, Only the Disabled Are Dying, for more. And feel free to use my ex's story. Anyone who says don't politicize deaths is just trying to pretend like politics have no meaningful impact on people's lives. The vaccine was rushed. It's experimental. The funding was right there, ready to go, and a general blueprint of the vaccine already existed. It's like saying, I don't trust the 2022 hybrid Jeep Wrangler because it only took a year to be developed. To be fair, I have no idea how long this Jeep Wrangler took to be developed. We're just going to say a year. I'm not looking it up. I do not care. My point is, we already understand the general blueprint of a hybrid car. We already have the technology. We drove it through all the same obstacle courses as all the other cars. We did the crash tests. This is a brand new vehicle, yes. Jeep Wranglers haven't been hybrids before, I think, probably. I'm not a car guy. But this Jeep has all the same stuff we've been using and working on for a long time. Now imagine if the entire world desperately needed a new hybrid Jeep Wrangler. Just think of all the red tape that could be cut through. No need to wait for funding, no need to spend years drafting research proposals, no need to wait to schedule trials. Your research is top priority, and everything else will wait and work around that. You could have crash tests as soon as you have a product. Then if those tests fail, you try again. But the tests are still done. It's like paying extra for priority on Uber Eats and skipping the queue. That cuts out like half the time you spend waiting because your order is now at the top of the list. Your food isn't any worse or less safe than it would be otherwise. It's just prioritized. I hear you can become sterile from the vaccine. What if that's true? There isn't really any logical or possible reason why this could be true. But it is good to be concerned about long-term effects of anything. Maybe check out my section on long COVID. The vaccine is literally the virus. Well, less dangerous pieces of the virus. If you aren't worried about being sterilized by COVID, then you definitely shouldn't worry about it from the vaccine. A few weeks after you're injected with the vaccine, nothing remains of it but the antibodies your body has produced. Exactly like how after you get COVID, you no longer have the virus a few weeks later, but instead, just the antibodies you've produced. All the ingredients of the vaccine are excreted in weeks. Unless you're allergic to one of these ingredients, you have nothing to worry about. I'm not a vaccinologist, but from what I've learned and will now horrifically oversimplify, there exist specialized memory cells who act as sort of bouncers for your immune system. And the vaccine is like showing your memory cells a mugshot of the virus and saying, Hey, if this guy comes near here, don't let him in. Whereas the immunity granted by the virus is more like letting that guy in, letting him wreak havoc, and then the cells learn the hard way not to let him in anymore. And of course, mutations make the bad guy look different enough that the bouncers might just let him in again, unless they're given an updated mugshot. Well, a more accurate analogy might be more like, instead of a mugshot, if you cut off the bad guy's head and showed that to the bouncers... Since the vaccine isn't a representation of the virus, it is neutralized parts of the virus. Like how a disembodied head is a neutralized part of a whole person. So a vaccine is like injecting the severed heads of your enemies so that your body learns to keep them out. Yep, perfect analogy. Whatever, I already had it. I have natural immunity. See my section about herd immunity. The virus itself doesn't seem to offer long-term protection against reinfection. There are reports of people becoming reinfected with Omicron just 30 days after having it. 
The vaccine appears to offer longer term protection, but not lifetime or bulletproof protection. You will likely need to get boosted every so often, just like the flu shot. I've seen reports suggesting a new booster every six months, and that seems pretty reasonable to me. The most robust protection, of course, is offered by a combination of so called natural immunity and vaccine immunity. That is, if you survive the virus. But natural versus vaccine immunity is really something of a false dichotomy, since your body literally can't tell the difference between immunity granted by the vaccine and that given by the virus. You produce the exact same antibodies either way. One way, the vaccine, is simply much, much safer. And no, it's not smart to constantly be reinfecting yourself with whatever new strain of the virus comes out, thinking you're strengthening your immune system. That's not how immune systems work. That's not how any of this works. You're just going to give yourself a post-viral condition and kill and disable a lot of people by spreading this around more. These data suggest that by your fifth infection, you have nearly a 50% chance of developing long COVID. The vaccine strengthens your immune system against COVID without the risk of post-viral conditions or the creation of more mutations. See my sections on mutations and long COVID for more. But what about herd immunity? How come we haven't developed herd immunity to the flu? It's because the flu isn't just one virus. It was one virus, but now it's many, many different variants. Herd immunity is not going to be a thing when the virus will simply keep mutating, as it's already done. That's why there's a new flu shot every single year, and why you should probably get boosted for COVID every six months or so. We also see now that any immunity granted by catching COVID-19 doesn't prevent reinfection and may not be as robust in the long term as immunity granted by vaccine. It's yet unclear how long any of these methods of immunity actually last. Estimates range from months to years, but currently it doesn't seem anything can offer lifetime immunity. That's not to say we won't one day somehow develop vaccines which can offer that, but I wouldn't count on the development of technology that might be impossible. Samuel Scarpino, a network scientist who studies infectious diseases at Northeastern University, said... The herd immunity threshold is not a we're safe threshold. It's a we're safer threshold. Even after the threshold has been passed, isolated outbreaks will still occur. So herd immunity, not a good plan. Well, whatever. It's just going to be endemic. Like you said, it's like the flu. Eradication is not yet impossible. Experts in New Zealand rate the eradicability of COVID-19 as similar to polio, but much harder than smallpox. Not impossible, but also not easy or immediate. And I'm not saying we shouldn't leave our houses for 20 plus years while we sort that out. That'd be ridiculous. But currently, that's the only course of action available to high-risk populations while the endemic prevalence is so high. So what does endemic prevalence mean? It means the amount of a disease found sloshing around in a population on average. Because no one is taking precautions and not enough people have immunity, far Far more people have COVID than is remotely reasonable, and anyone's risk of catching it is absurdly high. Disabled people understand that leaving your home is always a risk. High-risk people still go out during flu seasons and live their lives because the endemic prevalence, that is the number of people we expect to be infected, is not so high that it's particularly likely you'll catch it, especially if you wear a mask, get vaccinated, and avoid large gatherings during flu seasons which high-risk people already do. Only about 8% of people are sick with the flu every year, which is still too high of a number and could be greatly reduced, but compare that to an estimated 1 in 3 Americans who had COVID by the end of 2020. It's like, if a single fly was on a big delicious cake, you'd probably just flick it off and eat it, because it's unlikely you'll find more flies inside, and the cake looks like a fun time. But if there were dozens or hundreds of flies on a cake, you'd probably decide not to eat that at all, because the chances of eating a fly are much too high to make eating that cake a good choice. Unless you want to catch a bug. (sighs) God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. To quote Scarpino again, influenza is probably not less transmissible than COVID-19. Almost certainly the reason why flu did not show up this year is because we typically have about 30% of the population immune because they've been infected in previous years, 
and you get vaccination covering maybe another 30%. So you're probably sitting at 60% or so immune. Add mask wearing and social distancing, and the flu just can't make it. At the risk of jinxing myself, I personally have never had the flu or COVID. It's possible for us to take precautions to reduce the spread and increase the chances that I'll never get either disease and neither will anyone else in high-risk groups. If we offer support to quarantine everyone during times of outbreak, supply everyone with N95 or KN95 masks, and vaccinate most of our population, then we could drastically reduce the prevalence of Omicron in our communities. These measures in the short term would make our COVID and flu seasons significantly less severe, so hospitals won't have to keep dealing with overcapacity problems. And in the long term, There's a lowered chance of mutations, so vaccines will be easier to develop and eradication will be a closer and more realistic goal. Quarantining and mask wearing for a little while now could potentially save millions of lives in the future and significantly speed up the ultimate goal of eradication. Don't we want future generations to see the risk of COVID the way we currently see the risk of polio? We're all going to get it anyway. You just said one in three Americans had it in 2020. Again, has Everyone you've known caught the flu at some point in time? It's possible to reduce the prevalence of a disease in a population without everyone catching that disease. Besides, saying this and knowing that high-risk people are dying from it is the same as saying, hey disabled people, prepare to inevitably die from COVID. I've seen posts by people in high-risk groups who are writing their wills and preparing to inevitably die. I don't think you really recognize the implications when you say things like this. Not everyone has to get it. Not everyone should get it. We can prevent the spread. You should never look at the prevalence of a disease and think, well, looks like millions of people have this, so may as well go out and get it. We're all getting it anyway. Instead, you should see numbers rising and think, oh, shit, that's dangerous. We all better stay in a while until it dies down. I've accepted that we're not getting to zero cases anytime soon, no matter what precautions are put into place. It's reasonable to go out while there is some COVID, just as it's reasonable to go out while there's some flu or some strep or some rabies. But we should ultimately aim to eliminate all of these diseases, not just reduce their prevalence. And we should live in accordance with that goal. That means if you suspect you have any illness, even if it's just a cold, then you should wear a mask, or better yet, stay the fuck home. That's how it should always be. I can't tell you the rage I still have in my heart for all the students who would go to school when they were sick. It should never have become socially acceptable to go into public places when you're potentially contagious. Only the disabled are dying. The overwhelming number of deaths, over 75%, occurred in people who had at least four comorbidities. So really, these are people who were unwell to begin with. And yes, really encouraging news in the context of Omicron. All right, I have to respond to this specifically because, one, the CDC director did not communicate this well, to say the least. And two, people are taking the quote, way out of context, and using it to justify minimizing precautions. Let's just play the whole clip. First, the interviewer asks her about a specific vaccine study and if she thinks it ought to affect how we live our lives. To which Walensky says, You know, really important study, if I may just summarize it, a study of 1.2 million people who were vaccinated between December and October and demonstrated that severe disease occurred in about 0.1%. 0.15% of the people who are um, receive their primary series and death in 0.003% of those people. The overwhelming number of deaths, over 75%, occurred in people who had at least four comorbidities. So really, these are people who were unwell to begin with. And yes, really encouraging news in the context of Omicron. This um, means not only just to get your primary series, but to get your booster series. To clarify... This was a study analyzing how effective the vaccine is, not a study analyzing how many disabled people are dying of COVID versus abled ones. Of the 0.0033% of people in the study who died and were vaccinated, that is 
36 out of the 1.2 million vaccinated people, 75% had four or more comorbidities. That is 27 of those 36 people. This indicates that 75% of people who are vaccinated and still die, which is less than 5% of total COVID deaths, have four or more comorbidities. Not that 75% of total people dead from COVID have four or more comorbidities. This study says nothing about the 95% of cases in which people die from COVID, that is, when they're unvaccinated. The study really isn't relevant to mortality rates at all. It's just about vaccine efficacy rates. This is positive news for a vaccine, that it offers such substantial protection, that so few people in this study died. But it's terrible news for disabled people when it's broadcast in the way it was. The director of the CDC didn't say, the vaccine offers robust protection, but this study indicates there's still a major risk of death for people with four or more comorbidities. We should be careful to not infect this population while we find new ways to offer them protection. Additionally, we should be careful in general because we're increasing the probability of more variants and we still don't really know the potential long-term effects of catching the virus. Instead, she said, So really these are people who were unwell to begin with. And yes, really encouraging news in the context of Omicron. Yikes. People didn't hear, we should be cautious and protect vulnerable populations. They heard, you'll be fine as long as you're not disabled. Disabled people will die, sure. But whatever, who cares? And if we want to talk about a single factor that accounts for the most deaths, then it's vaccination status, not disability. That's what this study is evidence for. I repeat, 95% of people dying from COVID are unvaccinated. Let's not focus on who has what disability unless we're talking about ways to protect them. But these disabled people make up such a small percent of our population. Aren't they dying anyway? Why should we all be forced to wear masks and social distance? So, literally everyone is going to die anyway. I'm so sorry to break the news of your own mortality to you like this. But that's beside the point. It should not be reassuring that only elderly or disabled people are dying, even if it were true. Even if we wanted to do eugenics and weed out the unfit, neglecting that we're defining fitness as specifically the ability to not die from COVID-19 and its variants, a skill that has not been useful at any other point in history, and which we could have simply eradicated the need for with quarantine and vaccines, viruses mutate much much faster than humans. The only thing you're naturally selecting for is more variants of the virus. I'd suggest if, slash when, natural selection comes up, posing this in the form of a question, like, aren't you concerned about mutations? Furthermore, disabled people don't make up a small percent of the population. According to this article from 2015, over 95% of the world's population has at least one health problem, and over a third report more than five. It's the norm to have at least one medicalized condition. 95% of the world doesn't identify as disabled, of course. Having a medicalized condition does not necessarily make a person disabled. But the point is, almost every single person in the world has an underlying condition that anti-vaxxers can claim as a reason for death if they contract COVID. After my 31-year-old ex, who worked 12 hours a day on his feet, died from COVID, his anti-vax friend tried to claim it was because he had arthritis and drank too much coffee, not because he was unvaccinated. And I especially wouldn't be so quick to say only the disabled are dying when 10-30% to 30 of people who catch COVID go on to develop long COVID. And if that happens, then you'll be one of the disabled that you weren't so worried about dying. See my section on long COVID for more. We still don't have good data on reinfection rates. We still don't have good data on how much protection is offered by the vaccine against long COVID. It's not unlikely that you could catch one strain of COVID, develop long COVID or permanent lung damage, and then catch a different mutation later that you couldn't survive. You can become disabled at any time, but that chance is particularly high right now. Disabled lives are worth living. We don't 
want to die or risk developing yet another chronic pain condition. And we don't have to die. There are plenty of options other than eugenics and breeding superbug variants which are constantly outrunning protection offered by our vaccines. Plus, COVID cases are still taking up capacity in hospitals. So, no, not only the disabled are dying. If you, a hypothetical abled person, get into a car accident and you're rushed to the ER, but those beds are full of COVID patients, you're not going to get the care you need. No beds in the hospital means no beds, means no beds. No beds for your stroke, no beds for your heart attack, no beds for your car crash, no beds for your sick child. I just think we should let nature run its course. Okay, this one's a little more mask off than the others. No pun intended. Except you can see I've written that in my script and chose not to delete it, so that pun was, in fact, completely intended. Again, how are we defining nature? How natural is global disease transmission in mere weeks because of international trade and travel? How natural is it to simply pretend nothing is happening and take no precautions while millions of people have died? How natural is it to have to work 40 hours a week typing data into computers or scanning groceries for access to food and shelter? Is this the hill you want to die on? Literally? Okay, I'm trying. Empathetic. Discussion. Not a lecture. Okay. I assume this comes from just another common misunderstanding of natural selection and how evolution works. Evolution is adaptation to an environment. It's not the creation of an ubermensch. If we give the whole world deadly viruses, it will not create a superhuman. It will just kill a ton of regular humans. Possibly even all of the regular humans. Ask what they think will be the outcome of letting nature run its course. And the fact is, we're not all born into the same environment. Our current hierarchies are not natural or justifiable. Do you really think 10% of people in the world should own 85% of global household wealth? The way we live every day is just as artificial as any vaccine, if not more so. Whatever so-called evolution you think might happen is not natural or even desirable unless you think our current hierarchies are natural or desirable. COVID deaths aren't natural selection. It's artificial selection based on access to resources and education, which are systematically denied to marginalized populations. It's artificial selection based on access to work that can be done from home and ability to pay for grocery delivery services. It's artificial selection based on who can afford to live. This is a mass disabling event that will disproportionately affect the poor and people in exploited or so-called developing nations. And I should hope I don't have to convince you that rich people don't have better or different genes than poor people. These are not distinct breeding populations. Evolution doesn't work like that. Humans are the real virus. Aren't there too many people in the world? What if God gave us these diseases to help us? To be fair, this one is not generally stated outright as support for letting COVID rip through the population, like so many Doritos Locos Tacos through one's digestive tract. But I've seen echoes of it too many times to think we can just ignore it. The overpopulation thing, not the tacos. Overpopulation is a myth. It's a lie. It's not true. We have more than enough resources to feed and house our entire population. We are simply choosing not to do it because we've set up this really fun game called capitalism instead. Amazon, for instance, will intentionally destroy products to keep the supply lower than the demand in order to artificially inflate prices. Grocery stores do the same thing, often throwing perfectly good food in dumpsters and pouring bleach on top of it to ensure people can't eat it out of the trash. If they just gave food away, why would people buy it? This tendency towards creating scarcity pervades all sectors of production and distribution. It's just smart business. This might be a lot to wrap your head around, because it sure seems like there isn't enough food or shelter since there are so many people who are unhoused and unfed. 
Here are links to other videos going into detail about what artificial or manufactured scarcity is, and how it creates this very useful illusion of overpopulation. I'd say it's best to steer clear of this discussion right now, as it's just going to use up time, but if you feel up for it, I've linked to resources. Overpopulation is typically a fairly lightly held belief, so it's not so hard to debunk. And very few people think massive corporations are anything other than evil already, so you have a pretty easy target to redirect the anger. Just reframe what they're saying into complaints about supply chains and manufactured scarcity. The key is to support their initial observation, but change the framing. If they say, there's just not enough for everyone, look at how many people are starving. Say something like, yes, there are too many people unfed, that's a real problem. Did you know only 10% of the U.S. population works in agriculture and food production, but we produce enough to feed our entire population several times over? It's amazing the technology we have. And globally, we produce enough to feed 1.5 times the world's population. Just too bad that people aren't allowed access to food when they don't have money. I read that corporations pay farmers to destroy crops in order to lower supply and inflate prices. Our food distribution is all fucked up because of corporate greed. Plus, if you were truly concerned about there being too many people, you'd advocate for better access to birth control and education, the only things proven to actually reduce population. You'd advocate for better elder care systems, so there are enough people to care for the aging when we reduce the population. You'd advocate for guaranteed housing, or UBI, or any number of other measures with the intention of welcoming automation and reducing the workforce. And you'd eventually realize that a system founded on principles of infinite growth cannot survive on a finite planet, and will have to be abolished if we want to reach a population equilibrium. You wouldn't give a single shit about making things worse for poor people so they just give up and die already. Have you tried kill all the poor? Historically, that hasn't worked. It can't work. Our economy is such that if you were to kill this group of poor people, then there will simply have to be another group to take their place who will have all of the same problems of disability, crime, addiction, and whatever other poverty-related issues. Read up on the Reserve Army of Labor. The plague is not your friend. Okay, I got a little ranty there. If someone seems to be making an overpopulation argument, maybe you can see it as an opportunity to explain the Reserve Army of Labor in simple terms. Ask them, what do you think would happen if our workforce was significantly reduced? If they connect some dots and say that wages would go up, then ask questions like, so you're saying fewer workers means more demand for workers and therefore higher wages? So wouldn't it be better for business owners for there to be more unemployed people in order so that they could pay lower wages? Would you say corporations are kind of incentivized to increase this unemployment rate and keep some people unemployed in order to keep wages low? And if a market is expanding, doesn't their population also need to expand with it? So how do you think it would be possible to sustain our economy and reduce the population? It sounds kind of like maybe you don't want a smaller population at all. You actually just want more power over corporate interests. Aren't there other ways this can be achieved? And then you've done it. There are Marxists now. I'm kidding. I, I wish it were so easy. But you can maybe plant a little revolutionary seed. But we have to go to work. How are people supposed to provide for themselves? Yes, it's scary to not have secure access to food or housing. Do you think it's fair that in an emergency, everyone still has to work in order to have access to these things? Ask questions like, do you feel like X job is essential to keep the world running? Or do you feel like X people could take a month off of work or work from home and the world would still be essentially the same? Some of us do have to go to work. Doctors, nurses, caregivers, people who provide and deliver food, water, medicine, and electricity. Not servers in restaurants. Not people who spin signs outside of tech repair shops. Not all the people who can work remotely. Not right now. I am aware that in our current economy, people have to have jobs in order to afford things. 
What I'm saying is that people don't have to do bullshit jobs at all for society to function, and can simply be allowed to exist. And here's a good overview of how corporations have been taking care of us during the pandemic. People can have food and housing. We have more than enough of it. If that's confusing, please refer back to my section on overpopulation. If it's clear your person is nowhere near here at all, which they likely won't be, then I think you can at least get them to agree that we have enough food and housing to last people a couple weeks or even a month of self-isolation during times of outbreak. Trying to get them to see alternatives to capitalism in the long term would likely require many, many long conversations due to deeply entrenched capitalist realism. This term was defined by Mark Fisher in his book of the same title as basically the idea that there can't possibly be any alternative to our current mode of production and distribution. The idea that you have to work for 40 hours a week as a store clerk at JCPenney in order to not only be worthy of a house and food, but also for the world to function at all. And if you say, well, no, I think the world can live without JCPenney, not only for a month, but forever, and show people workable alternatives to our economic system, then often people will still go on about work ethic and how people have to do meaningless labor for their own good, even if it doesn't directly benefit society. You know, it molds them into good people. Otherwise, people will be lazy and never invent anything or help anyone and just, like, starve to death and be unhoused, like how everyone starved and nothing was ever built or invented in pre-capitalist societies. I don't, I don't really know. This is, I believe, what people on the internet would call a cope. It's just one of many ways people justify and normalize an unjust system. I'm not saying abolishing capitalism or radicalizing your acquaintances is a remotely realistic solution to the immediate issues of the pandemic, but reducing the power of the owning class in any way possible will be helpful, and is now more than ever a matter of life or death. And this can only be achieved through collective action. Right now, that means work strikes, rent strikes, and demands for food and financial assistance. When someone says, but we have to work, find a polite way to say, not all of us. Not right now. And if JCPenney shuts down forever because they had to close for a month, then so be it. When it comes down to people dying or businesses closing and you side with the businesses, I'm going to need you to take your entire head out of your ass. And if you accidentally say something like this because you're starting to lose your patience, then... Usually people make impassioned pleas to save small businesses and talk about how their uncle owns a pizzeria and he's a nice guy and the pandemic is going to kill his whole business and then his kids will starve and people will suffer either way. Yes, that's the whole point. That's the problem. There it is. You found it. I'm sure your uncle is a nice guy and his kids don't deserve to be on the brink of houselessness and starvation because he has to gamble on a business in order to provide for them. No one deserves that. No one needs to live like that. That's my whole point. Anyway, ask them, how exactly would temporary assistance harm small businesses? Especially if this assistance also went to the business owners. Remember that these aren't bad people. They want everyone to be fed and housed and happy and healthy. They also want everything to stay the same in a system where it's impossible for everyone to be fed and housed and happy and healthy. Mutations. Viruses mutate the more they're passed around. A really basic analogy might be like a game of telephone. Maybe you start with the phrase, where's the key to the shed? That phrase is COVID, the original flavor. So the phrase gets passed from person to person until some people are saying, Where's the key to the bread? Well, that's a little different now. Then the phrase gets passed around even more until some people are saying, Where did the tree go to bed? Now that's just silly. Ha ha, we're all having a good time. To expand this analogy, potentially to a breaking point, a normal response to the original phrase, Where's the key to the shed? might be, I always keep it in my pocket. We can think of that response as the original vaccine. It makes sense. It works it's a good response. When the virus becomes, where's the key to the bread, 
The response, I always keep it in my pocket, is a bit odd. I have questions about why the bread is locked up and why you always need a key on your person. It just doesn't work as well as a response. But it still kind of works, logically. Just like how the vaccine still kind of works for Omicron. But if we keep passing the phrase around and let it become something totally different, like where did the tree go to bed, then our response, I always keep it in my pocket, the response developed for a different sentence entirely, will make no sense. Viruses naturally mutate into more mild forms. They don't want to kill people. They want people to survive so they can be passed around. This is a debunked myth. Viruses do not naturally mutate into milder forms. They mutate randomly. If anything, there's a tendency to become more contagious, but not necessarily less fatal. Viruses do not want anything. They don't have desire. They're not even technically alive. This myth comes from, well, it's a really sad story that involves killing a ton of rabbits. Just a warning. So rabbits were an invasive species in Australia. They were brought there to be hunted for sport and left to reproduce in the wild. By the early 1900s, Australia was obviously completely overrun. So the government did biological warfare and released a deadly virus on them. This virus initially had a 99.8% kill rate, but then during the next outbreak, this kill rate reduced to only 90%. Wow, that sounds pretty definitively like viruses just get milder. Except, when we checked in on that virus in the 80s, we found that a larger percentage of circulating virus is highly virulent, even deadlier than before. Why would the deadliest strains exist in larger proportions than the more mild ones if it's smarter for viruses to be less deadly? Because viruses aren't smart. The most logical path of evolution isn't the path that's destined to happen. Additionally, taking a human-centric approach doesn't make much sense even if we anthropomorphize viruses, particularly when talking about COVID, which, as we know, can and does infect other species. As this article so wonderfully puts it, imagine we are the rabies virus. Do we need to evolve to be benign in humans to survive in the long run? No, and clearly we haven't. Once symptoms appear, rabies is essentially 100% fatal in humans. And that's okay, because we can survive and spread more easily in an animal host, like dogs, bats, and raccoons. I'm not even going into the issues with global spread and how this will absolutely ravage more exploited countries with less access to medical care. And wow, have we all forgotten what happened to Native Americans? An estimated 90-95% to of their population was wiped out by diseases brought by Europeans. How can Americans ever expect to be allowed to travel anywhere ever again when other countries took precautions and didn't need to develop an immunity to whatever we're breeding here. Don't buy into the idea that Omicron is mild, or that it's in any way good to give it more opportunities to mutate. The only thing that'll make COVID milder is to reduce its prevalence. Long COVID isn't even real. It's just mass hysteria. And even if it was real, I'm vaccinated and healthy. I won't get it. If you don't think long COVID is a threat, that's either because... 1. You don't believe disabled people's experiences are real, because if you did, you wouldn't need mask mandates. Or 2. You think that you personally are doing something right that will prevent it, and therefore think anyone who gets long COVID, or any other post-viral conditions, did something wrong, and it's their fault. So, what do we even mean when we say long COVID? Long COVID presents as an array of over 200 different symptoms, but most commonly... So there's joint pain. I have pretty bad muscle and joint pain. Sometimes I have a limited ability to walk. There's fatigue. Sleeping 12 to 14 hours every night, taking a long nap in the afternoon. There's memory issues. It will be hard for me to remember this conversation in a few weeks. I had a fever for um, four months. Or some patients talk about issues with menstruation. During that one week of the month, I feel like I'm having almost a mini COVID. And talking to patients, I heard of a lot of other symptoms. So insomnia, tightness in the chest, um, waking up in the middle of the night with trouble breathing, persistent loss of smell and taste. 
These symptoms are not a minor inconvenience. 45% of people, nearly half of all people who get long COVID, report symptoms so severe that they have to reduce their workloads, and many can't return to work at all. Post-viral conditions aren't new. If COVID didn't cause chronic symptoms to occur in some people, it would actually be weird. People who get influenza or Ebola or any sort of virus are at risk for developing post-viral conditions. This has been known since at least 1918. However, long haulers are opposed to calling it a post-viral condition, fearing it might be a misnomer, since one theory is that some amount of virus is still tucked away in the body in what are called viral reservoirs. And remnants of the virus have been found in some patients. Though the best indicator so far appears to be significant microclot formation, a thing which isn't tested for with routine blood work. And good luck applying for disability benefits, even if you can afford the time and money to get these tests. Only 22% of initial social security claims are approved. It took me over two years in a court hearing to get approved, and I couldn't even complete public school due to the severity of my conditions. Talk to anyone with ME-CFS, or really any invisible illness, for more information about medical gaslighting and disability gatekeeping. An estimated 10-30% to of people who catch COVID will go on to have long COVID symptoms. The severity of infection doesn't seem to matter as to whether or not you can get it. Long COVID has been reported even in cases of asymptomatic infections. This also lends proof to long COVID being a distinct condition from post-ICU or from simply being a result of normal recovery processes. It's yet unclear how much protection is offered by the vaccine, though there's evidence that it offers a significant, but not 100% bulletproof, amount. We know pretty solidly that 9.5% to 14% of breakthrough infections still result in long COVID. You can still get Omicron with the vaccine, and you can still get long COVID. The probability is just lower. For this variant, anyway. See my sections on mutations. We don't yet fully know the risk factors for long COVID. It appears to happen regardless of known underlying conditions. Freelance data scientist and artist Tana Davis says the scariest part about COVID-19's cognitive effects is that people of all ages and health status are affected. She says, this is something everyone is at risk for, and it's completely debilitating. People who were considered particularly healthy, people who worked out regularly, ate healthy diets, hardly ever got sick, are now bed-bound. You can do everything right and still get sick. In fact, a disproportionate number of people who have long COVID now were previously on strict fitness regimens, and it's been hypothesized that they may have developed the condition exactly because of their fitness habits. To my understanding, long COVID might be something of an autoimmune condition, at least in some cases, that is, the result of an immune system continuing to attack healthy cells. So if you put the stress of working out on top of an already overactive immune system, then you'll have a massive immune response. Inflammation everywhere, including inflammation in the brain, leading to a measurable decrease in cognitive abilities. But that's just a theory that I've poorly explained. The mechanisms are still not really known. It is known that long COVID can affect anyone regardless of how healthy they were when they caught the virus, and regardless of how mild the infection was. See this video if you want more information about long COVID risk factors. In fact, you should check out this guy's whole channel if you have an interest. He's been doing an incredible job at consolidating long COVID research into easily digestible content. There are a lot of different theories as to how and why any of this happens, but there's no doubt that it is happening. I'm not a doctor, so I won't poorly explain all the theories in science. You can listen to this long This Week in Virology episode, or this short explained podcast episode about it if you're curious. Well, I take care of myself, so I'm not worried. You are not in complete control of your health and wellness. You are not special. You alone have not figured out the holy ratio of quinoa to turmeric that grants immortality. Sorry, viewer. Be nicer than that if someone you care about says this. I'm, I'm just tired. Each time you catch COVID, your chances of getting long COVID go up significantly. And then you'll no longer be fit, and you will no longer be fine. People get sick and it's no one's fault. Thinking you're safe because you're a good person and you do everything right 
is called the just world fallacy, a thing I talk about in my first video. When this feeling of invulnerability is challenged, people don't hear, hey, hey, no, it's okay. This is out of everyone's control. They hear, I think you haven't done enough, and you deserve COVID. Because still, somewhere in their minds, they think that the people who died deserved it. Otherwise, they wouldn't think that they, a good and healthy person, will be fine. When someone says something like this, it's usually best to affirm that they are fit, and they are doing everything they can, and refocus the conversation on community care and mutations. But if you want to try and get them to face their own mortality, ableism, and classism, ask them, how do you take care of yourself differently than other people? Those people should have simply lost weight, eaten right, taken oxygen, taken massive doses of vitamin C, done the blah, 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 sun yoga. Not had autoimmune disorders? Most people don't have access to the kinds of food, healthcare, vitamins, fitness regimen, free time, and ability to isolate from the general population as, oh, let's say, random example, Joe Rogan. A man who did, in fact, catch COVID, and then, quote, threw the kitchen sink at it, including many experimental treatments, and is now back on air telling people not to get vaccinated because it's experimental. Interesting. People are so afraid of losing whatever sense of control they think they have. But there are so many cases of able-bodied people catching COVID and dying, or becoming permanently disabled. In fact, a disproportionate number of highly active people are going on to develop long COVID. See my section on long COVID. And simply because you might come out of it okay, doesn't mean the people around you will. Maybe offer an anecdote, if you have one, of someone you know who was healthy and then died or developed chronic conditions as a result of COVID. It'll probably be dismissed, but if it's someone you both know, then yeah, Maybe it might strike a nerve somewhere. There are a lot of ways you can strengthen your immune system. Eating healthy foods, getting adequate sleep, exercising, being exposed to a little bit of a pathogen in a controlled way so that you produce antibodies. No one's debating that. They've made up a guy who thinks no one should take care of themselves, and they're arguing with no one. All anyone is saying is that not everyone can take care of themselves. And those people don't deserve to die. We need to design interventions for the world that we have, not for the world we wish we had. If you have to work 80 hours a week, or overnight shifts, or otherwise sacrifice time others can afford to spend on rest, healthy sleep habits, healthy eating habits, mental health, and fitness, then of course your immune system will be worse. Yet somehow it's assumed to be natural selection when a person born into poverty who does real labor and provides a service at McDonald's dies, and a wealthy landlord who makes $20,000 a day sitting on their ass lives from the same illness. This myth of personal responsibility for health is particularly disgusting, ableist, classist, and pervasive. I'm really losing my patience with it, in case that's not obvious. This attitude is a product of a society which expects inhuman feats of endurance and invincibility. These people are a product of an economic system and culture which devalues anyone incapable of such feats, anyone who can't pretend to have total control over their body at all times, which, in reality, is everyone. They're a product of manufactured scarcity and fear of showing weakness and the myth of rugged individualism. Add to that the media's mixed messaging about the efficacy of masks and vaccines and the reality of the pandemic, and it's obvious why people would want to simply ignore everything and try to live their lives like usual. It's understandable that their consciousness is here, and this is the way they'd rebel and try to assert their individuality in a culture where their bodies are used as fodder and they can't express themselves in a non-corporate way for at least 40 hours a week. In a culture where they're constantly told how free they are, yet they can't stop pretending to laugh at their boss's jokes without losing access to food, shelter, health care, and security. In a culture where working-class people feel disempowered, but are never taught why or allowed a legitimate political identity to organize for their own interests. 
Neither political party in America addresses or does anything to substantively combat working class exploitation. White working class people, the people who are most vocally and insufferably anti-vax and anti-mask, don't have a useful political identity through which they can express their dissatisfaction and alienation. Working class people have lived lives where they felt both powerless and invincible, able to work for 20 hours straight, yet unable to say no to doing so. Of course this is how this contradiction of the myth of personal freedom and the reality of systemic disempowerment comes to be expressed. It's important to keep in mind that these people, while they may hold a certain amount of privilege, whiteness, maleness, being young or abled, they're still disempowered and they do have legitimate feelings even if they have no productive or legitimate outlet through which to channel them. The purpose of these conversations is to acknowledge these feelings and guide them towards productive action. I'm vaccinated, and I take care of myself. I doubt I'll have any issues when I catch it. Great. Glad you got vaccinated. But you do still need a mask, and you do still need to isolate as much as possible. It doesn't have to be when you catch it. It can still be if. You could personally still become permanently disabled from this, even though you've been vaccinated and even if you have a mild infection. 9.5 to 14% of breakthrough infections still result in long COVID. And you can still pass the Omicron variant around. See my sections on mutations. Just stop playing this horrible game of telephone. It's a boring game anyway. It's not good. You spend all the time standing around waiting for something to happen, and then the joke is just that the phrase isn't the same phrase from the beginning to, ha ha, wow, so funny. Listen, I mishear things all the time. I don't need 15 children in a conga line to do that for me. This got off topic. Anyway, when a person says this, ask them what they think their risk of long COVID might be, and ask them about their understanding of mutations. Ask them why they feel safe going out when there are so many cases and so many hospitalizations and so little research on the possible future effects of this virus. This is a person who at least trusts science enough to get the vaccine, so they'll probably be more open to statistics and a scientifically informed cost-benefits analysis. Additionally, there are so many high-risk people in our communities, and they all deserve to be safe and to be able to one day re-enter the world. To quote this article again, The vaccine is not bulletproof, Scarpino says. Imagine that a vaccine offers 90% protection. If before the vaccine you met at most one person, and now with vaccines you meet 10 people, you're back to square one. Every day that abled people go to crowded venues is another month disabled people can't leave our houses or see our friends without risking death. If you just stay home a while so this shit can settle down, then we could all go out and have a good time together. Omicron is mild, especially if you're vaccinated. It's just a bad cold. Ask them why they think it's mild. Likely, they'll respond either that viruses tend to become more mild over time, which is a myth, see my section about it, or that the proportion of people getting infected to hospitalizations is lower than that of the other variants, which doesn't matter when millions of people are infected and millions are hospitalized. And if you do need to be hospitalized, I can promise you won't be saying it's mild then. Imagine if you're drowning in your own body. That's what it feels like. Again, an estimated 10 to 30% of people who get COVID end up with long COVID, a post-viral disease similar to ME-CFS. It doesn't matter how mild your infection is. The vaccine offers protection, but it's not bulletproof. If you catch it, there's a good chance you'll never recover to full health. Nearly half of people with long COVID cannot return to work full-time. See my section on long COVID for more. A record high of more than 142,000 people were hospitalized with confirmed COVID-19 on January 15th. This kind of overcapacity means hospitals have to ration care, rescheduling non-COVID-related procedures and appointments, transferring health care workers from other units, and sometimes making the decision to shut down entire essential care units, like how this Florida hospital shut down its labor and delivery unit. If 
everyone had this attitude and stopped taking precautions seriously, just imagine how absolutely overrun our healthcare system would be. Even if you personally just experience a mild cold, millions of people will not have that experience, and you need to take every precaution in your power to be sure they don't catch it. Additionally, even if you experience a mild cold, you're still allowing the virus more opportunity to mutate. See my sections on mutation for why this is a terrible idea. I'm tired of seeing this messaging about Omicron being mild, and therefore it's fine to give it to everyone. It's not fine. It's not mild. Wear a mask and stay inside. To hear more disabled people rant about this terrible messaging, I'd recommend the Death Panel podcast episode, Vaxxed and Collapsed. Well, even if it's bad and I end up in the hospital or with long COVID, we have treatments. What about Iver? No, no, no. Yeah, cut that. We can't say that here. We definitely have more care options now than we did at the beginning of the pandemic, many of which are actually legitimate. But we still don't have anything better than simply not getting sick in the first place. People who haven't experienced chronic pain or serious illness tend to believe that contracting any disease is like getting a little bruise. When the average person gets a bruise, they maybe put some ice on it, and after a few weeks it goes away. Not a trace left. It's like they never even had it in the first place. But this is a very dangerous attitude to have about infections, particularly viral infections. Many people think that if you get COVID and it gets bad, then you simply go to the doctor, you get magic pills or magic nasal spray, and then in a week or two, you're back to normal, not a scratch on you. And maybe that's the case for some people, but obviously, sometimes, cuts leave scars. Sometimes you never heal completely. These scars from COVID can be in your lungs, or in your heart, or in your brain. I'm not only talking about long COVID, but other long-term health effects classified outside of that umbrella that could come from pneumonia, or oxygen deprivation, or any number of other complications. If you have to be intubated, this can do serious damage to your vocal cords. You might never be able to speak again, if you survive. Going to the hospital for COVID isn't like taking your car to the mechanic. Doctors can't just isolate and fix the one part of you that's broken and leave the rest perfectly intact. Hell, mechanics don't even do that sometimes. Some viruses, like HSV-1 or oral herpes, which over 90% of the population has, live in your body for your entire life and go through periods of latency and outbreak. Some people never experience an outbreak, and others experience them frequently. It's yet unclear how persistent COVID is, and it's been hypothesized that long COVID may be due to some amount of the virus still remaining in the body. In general, it doesn't seem likely that COVID is a lifelong sort of virus for the average person who contracts it. But again, not enough information is known. In the meantime, the safest course of action is to simply avoid catching it. When illnesses are beyond the limits of modern medicine's ability to cure, like how extreme cases of COVID and long COVID obviously are, people will often see that and believe it can't be true because Look at all the bruises I've healed from. I don't deserve to be sick like this. I've never done anything wrong. I've always taken care of myself. This is not fair. There must exist a cure somewhere. There must be a reason doctors are hiding the cure from us. If you start with the assumptions of 1. A fair and benevolent world, and 2. Disability being inherently bad, or a punishment for not taking care of yourself, rather than just normal and natural and inevitable, like most people do, this is a pretty baseline level of ableism, then this is a pretty logical thought process. It's logical to construct conspiracies and turn to pseudoscience and alternative medicine in an ableist society. And I'm not dissing all alternative medicine, nor do I even like our current medical institutions. I plan to make a more nuanced video on that topic in the future. But just because modern medicine can't do shit for chronic illnesses doesn't mean you should believe every charlatan who tells you what you want to hear. I am Professor Patrick. Professor. Dr. Professor Patrick. Lockdowns don't work anyway. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes. Just look at the rate of COVID in other countries that did lockdowns. I mean, no, uh, ask questions. Like, why would you think that? Well, why don't you just stay home if you're so worried about it? I mean, that is what we're doing. 
as much as possible. But despite what you might think, disabled people are still part of society and need access to resources. We still need to get groceries, get meds, see doctors, see dentists, run errands, and many of us go to work and have regular jobs. Like, is this really your plan? To ostracize and deny public safety and services to a significant and growing proportion of the population? Kids need to be in school. They need to be socialized. I agree. Children do need to be socialized, and it is bad for them to be isolated. We've all met those weird homeschool kids. You know, the ones who grow up to lecture strangers on the internet about COVID precautions instead of having friends. But it's much worse for children to catch COVID and die or become permanently disabled, or even to pass COVID around to their family members who subsequently die or become permanently disabled. I'm not saying no more school ever. I'm saying we need more precautions put into place, and ideally, no more in-person school right now. As much as everyone hates to isolate children, it is necessary to keep a remote learning option available, particularly during outbreaks, in order to reduce the number of students in classes and minimize unknown future harm. Kids need friends, but they do not need constant unmasked socialization with dozens of other children in a building full of hundreds of other children and can instead get an appropriate amount of peer interaction in smaller groups while wearing masks, even while occasionally switching to primarily online interactions. Children would still see their caregivers unmasked every day, and babies would still be able to develop the ability to recognize facial expressions without any issue, even if everyone outside of their immediate family was masked all the time, which they wouldn't necessarily need to be if people were testing frequently, wearing masks most of the time, and vaccinated. For the people suddenly worrying about children's mental health when it serves them, we know isolation isn't great. But comparatively, how healthy do you think it would be for a child to bring home a virus that kills their beloved family members? Seems like having people die preventable deaths because of something you brought home to them would be... Eh, may be challenging to cope with psychologically. I think we can agree that death and permanent disability are much bigger psychological stressors than temporarily isolating a child from their peers. Over 900 children have died from COVID as of the writing of this video, and an unknown number, estimates range from 5 to 30% infected, will be permanently disabled by long COVID. We still have no idea what the long-term effects of this virus might be. Vaccine trials for those under five are still underway, so this population is still completely unprotected. Pediatric hospitalizations are currently at an all-time high as of the writing of this video in January of 2022. Compare the media coverage of these 900 deaths to the approximately 100 children who are abducted by strangers every year. We should be hearing about this every single day. Let me repeat, over 900 children have died from a disease that could have been eliminated if we had taken precautions. These are preventable deaths. The 100-ish children randomly abducted by strangers every year are much harder to prevent, yet there are so many campaigns trying to do so. If COVID didn't become a politicized issue, just like how child abductions are not politicized yet, then we'd already have stranger danger level campaigns against people not wearing masks or not getting vaccinated. Well, okay, maybe child abductions are a little bit politicized because of the whole, like, Pizzagate thing. Some people are maybe concerned to the point of conspiracy about it. Remember, friends, billionaires and politicians do not have to be pedophiles in order to be bad people. They are already bad people. I don't doubt that a significant proportion of them are probably pedophiles. It seems likely. I don't know. I, I honestly haven't been keeping up with that stuff. However, accusations of pedophilia have a long anti-LGBTQ plus history, and hysteria over this can easily be weaponized against marginalized groups and directed into a witch hunt. We're already seeing this in Florida with the Don't Say Gay Bill. 
you know, maybe if you know someone who's into Q stuff and an anti-masker, then telling them masks are for protecting the children could mean something. I don't know. If someone's like, think of the children, they need to be in school, you need to think of the children back at them and tell them over 900 children have literally fucking died. But do it nicely. In addition to a remote learning option, there must be child care options and support in place for parents to stay home and supervise their children. And of course, the continuation of free meal plans regardless of whether or not students are physically in class. I understand that some children must go to school in order to be fed. I volunteered at two different schools where over 95% of students were receiving free lunch, and several of the children were unhoused in addition to being food insecure. This is a massive failing on a systemic level. What we can do right now is enact common sense harm reduction. Ideally, we switch back to online learning or at least minimize the number of children in our schools, minimize the number of children in hallways or at assemblies at any one time, test students frequently, every weekend ideally, quarantine those infected, provide every child and staff member with PPE, and ease the burden of childcare on parents who lack housing, food, or time. For a bit more about why it was, and continues to be, a terrible idea to reopen schools, see this video made one year ago warning us about reopening schools, and what would happen, and what did, in fact, happen. People are traumatized from the isolation. The cost to our mental health is too high. We need to end it. My first impulse is to say, why don't you ever think of all the housebound disabled people and our isolation? But no, it's not productive to be bitter. It's not productive to minimize or compare trauma. When a person says this, I'd urge you to face it with compassion. One of my best friends from childhood was having a lot of issues with the lockdowns in her country. She came from an abusive household where she would be put on lockdown by her parents at random, and this experience brought back so much of that pain. She was in tears, wondering why people weren't protesting what the government was doing. Her husband and everyone else kind of just told her to suck it up. She's obviously not in America. No one was taking her seriously, but I knew her history. I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her about it. She hadn't connected the isolation with her childhood trauma. She was beating herself up for feeling so affected by it when other people seemed to be okay. She asked me if she should talk to her therapist about it, if she could consider it PTSD. And I said, yeah, you don't have to ask me for permission to feel what you're feeling. None of us are okay. Some of us are just more used to it. There are ways to minimize what's being called pandemic fatigue, like reaching out to friends, mixing up your routine with new, still safe activities like going to a park or starting a new hobby, exercise and meditation, and finding assurance knowing that lockdown is necessary and temporary. Oh, and of course, seeking professional help. Now, if only that were a free and available option to everyone in one of the wealthiest nations on earth. If you really cared about trauma and mental health, you'd be fighting for universal health care, not for getting people back into routines that will inevitably result in preventable and traumatic death and permanent disability. Aha! You admit that it's not such a big deal for you. You people are addicted to lockdowns. I personally lost two close friends to their mental health struggles over the course of the pandemic. They were both also disabled. If you think, for a second, that disabled people want lockdowns, that anyone in the world wants to be in lockdown, then I don't know what world you live in. Again, you're making up a guy to argue with who doesn't exist. We want to be safe and not die. We want to prevent deaths and permanently disabling conditions. This means we have to do lockdowns. I understand the risks all too well. Disabled people understand what isolation is and what it does to a person. But we also understand what viruses do. And we understand that there are ways to adapt to isolation and stay in touch with friends and family without seeing them physically. There are ways to be supported emotionally that don't require physical presence. And if people had ways to be supported financially during lockdown, 
then that would substantially reduce the mental strain. Disabled people aren't arguing for eternal lockdowns with no financial or emotional support. That's what you're arguing for, for high-risk people. We aren't arguing that people should live on the streets because they can't afford rent because they had to quit their job in order to protect vulnerable people in their households. That's what you're arguing when you say we should keep everything open all the time, no matter how many cases there are. I'm not talking about being locked down for years. I'm talking about being locked down for seasons and adjusting how we assess risk and protect our communities. I'm talking about normalizing sick leave, quarantine, testing, and mask wearing. We can absolutely reduce the amount of COVID sloshing around in the general population to a reasonable level of risk. The choice between lockdowns or keeping everything open is presented as a choice between the comfort of abled people or the lives of disabled people. That's a false choice. Abled and disabled is a false dichotomy, especially in the face of a pandemic. Instead, we need to look at our population as going to be disabled and already disabled. Doing what's best for disabled people now, and always, is doing what's best for everyone. We have a lot of options other than death. This is traumatic. This is difficult. But we can't pretend nothing is happening. In the long run, it's better to take your child out of school for a while than expose them to a potentially disabling or even deadly virus. It's better to push for pandemic wages and rent freezes rather than keep going to work because the economy can recover, whereas you and your family might not. And if the economy doesn't recover, fuck it. I never liked it anyway. It's not even real. Watch my other videos. If you continue living your life as usual, this virus will continue to mutate. The more that able-bodied people pass it around, the longer disabled people have to stay quarantined for our own protection. And the less safe and accessible resources like groceries, healthcare, and education will be for us. Separate but equal is never really equal. When we first learned about it, we could have all simply been like, okay, let's all hit the pause button for a month. No rent, no leaving your house, no international travel, no school, masks for all. And guess what? We probably wouldn't be here talking about COVID today. Just look at the rates of COVID in other countries that had lockdowns and provided PPE and temporary wages. Remember the Ebola scare all those years ago? How many of us have been vaccinated for Ebola? This two-year-long pandemic wasn't inevitable. The need to vaccinate our entire population wasn't even inevitable. But now, there's no hope for eradicating COVID any time in the next couple of years only reducing it and staying one step ahead of mutations with vaccines. It's exhausting. It didn't have to be this way. And you're all only making it go on longer and hurt more people by trying to live some post-pandemic life. There is no post-pandemic. If you want to talk about trauma, let's talk about that. We still don't even know the long-term health effects of this virus. I mean, it could be like chickenpox, where people might get something like shingles down the line. It's a much better idea to expose yourself to the known risks of isolation, rather than this unknown pathogen. Well, people are over-testing anyway. What? What is this even? Are people seriously? The reason we have more cases than other countries is because our testing is so much. Of course. Ugh. Okay. People are seriously saying this. Okay. So, slow down and think about that for, like, five seconds. It's far, far worse and way more dangerous to under-report COVID, a disease that kills and permanently disables people, than it is to over-report, if that's the concern here. I assume the concern is mass hysteria causing psychological issues over a problem that's actually minor. But this is clearly not a minor problem. Globally, over 5 million people have died, and over 32 million people will be permanently disabled. This is not normal, and we should not let it be normal. We should be afraid. We should demand support in order to protect ourselves and our loved ones. 
Imagine if some unknown number of people had a condition that caused their bodies to randomly explode like a grenade and kill anyone within six feet of them. The tests for this condition give a false positive in, oh, let's say one out of 61 cases. These tests also gave out false negatives at about the same rate. What would be a reasonable response to this information? Would it be to tell people not to test so much, because every so often there's a false positive? Would it be to tell the 61 cases that one of them is a false positive, so none of them should take precautions? Would it be to tell everyone not to panic? Would it be to think, well, only a few million people have tested positive, so I'm definitely safe leaving my home and not taking any precautions? Or would a reasonable response maybe be to tell anyone and everyone, particularly anyone who even slightly suspects they have it, to get tested and anyone who tests positive to quarantine for the necessary two weeks, even if they're asymptomatic? Why don't you see COVID as the emergency that it is? But I did everything right. I got vaccinated. I wore my mask. We shouldn't even be treating unvaccinated people anymore. If they aren't vaccinated by now, that's their fault. Hospitals should just turn them away. This would be an incredibly dangerous and irresponsible precedent to set for healthcare. Don't get me wrong, I'm pissed off at unvaccinated people too. I've been to the Herman Cain Awards subreddit. I understand wanting these people to face the consequences of their actions and feeling a tiny, horrible bit of vindication when they die or become very ill as a result of their own ignorant, misinformed, and just plain selfish decisions. But this is just another way to advocate for eugenics, this time based on people's access to information. Also, don't forget that there are a number of people who can't, for medical reasons, get vaccinated, or for whom vaccines are less effective. Doctors already blame patients constantly for things that they perceive as choices. For the longest time, every issue I had was blamed on my erratic sleep schedule. And some of my problems were certainly exacerbated by this. But one, my sleep disorder is not a choice. And two, I still have those other chronic illnesses, even with regular sleep. I mean, ask any overweight person with a chronic illness how often their doctors brought up their weight when they were pursuing a diagnosis. When we give healthcare workers a pass based on perceived choices of patients, then we allow for a horrific amount of discrimination based on access to food, education, and free time. And globally, the majority of unvaccinated people didn't make the choice not to be vaccinated and don't deserve to die from whatever superbug we're breeding here. There are still major issues with global vaccine rollout, and in addition to that, plenty of people with health conditions which prevent them from being vaccinated. I understand the importance of triage, and I understand that outcomes are much, much better for those who have been vaccinated. But healthcare workers have to do everything within their power to help patients, no matter how misinformed and dangerous that patient might be. Well, it's my body, and I get to choose what to do with it. Do you? Do you get to choose whether or not you wear clothes? Do you get to choose how many seats you can take up if the bus is full? Do you get to choose whether or not you can slap strangers across the face? Technically, yes, you have those choices. You could leave your house naked right now and go to church. You're free to do that. But you're not free from the social consequences of that. And if you're concerned about some kind of authoritarian regime, I mean, how exactly would it expand our police surveillance state for businesses to require masks in addition to already requiring pants and shoes? And most importantly, do you not see that it's dangerous to spread COVID to other people? Why not? What people are arguing when they say, my body, my choice, in this context, is not the right to bodily autonomy and protection, which all people should have. What they're arguing is freedom from social consequences, which no one can have. Humans live interdependently with other humans. I'm speaking in a language that other people made up. I'm wearing clothes other people made. I drink water other people inspect that comes out of faucets other people installed. We all depend on our communities for survival. We always have. Obviously, there are plenty of unjust laws and silly social norms that don't actually protect anyone. 
but mask wearing isn't one of them. If you choose not to protect your community via mask wearing and getting vaccinated, then your community has the right to retaliate and legislate against this behavior, which endangers everyone's lives and well being. Your choice to not wear a mask, like your hypothetical choice not to wear clothes, doesn't only impact you, it impacts every member of your community you come into contact with your grandma, your children, your barber, your barber's grandma and children. If you wouldn't expose your naked body to these people, then you shouldn't expose your germs to them. And I don't even think we should have to wear clothes so much since naked bodies aren't inherently sexual, but that's a topic for a very different video. Can you imagine a situation where a person's right to choose what to do with their body does not supersede a community's right to protection? If someone chooses to run through a busy street shooting off a machine gun, even if they only non-fatally hit one or two people, does their right to choose what to do with their body and their property overrule the danger they're putting other people in? Freedom of choice doesn't mean freedom from consequences. It never has. People can choose to do things which actively harm their community, and their community has every right to respond. If you choose not to get vaccinated, that's fine as long as you take responsibility to isolate yourself entirely from other people. You don't get to have your cake and eat it too. Solidarity. Instead of clumsily restating something which has been phrased more eloquently elsewhere, I want to quote from a really excellent article by Mia Mingus, which I read in the process of writing this video and thought, well, looks like someone's already said everything I want to say, but did it better. You're welcome for waiting until the end of this very long video to tell you that. Mia writes, Reframe your disappointment for having to cancel that event or gathering as an opportunity to practice interdependence, solidarity, and disability justice. In the same way you might refrain from attending or purchasing something you enjoy because you want to support workers on strike, support the most vulnerable groups from this pandemic. This includes the Global South, which is filled with BIPOC disabled people because we know that they will bear the brunt of the Global North's entitlement, selfishness, and greed. Most of the talking points I've made go back to protecting yourself, because people, especially American people, tend to intuitively think in terms of what immediately affects them as individuals. Separating our needs from the needs of our community in the name of so-called freedom has been incredibly useful for the people actively destroying our communities and our freedom. Let me be clear. I don't think this myth of rugged individualism is some kind of secret, shady plot or conspiracy that capitalists and politicians hatch to keep us all docile. There, there has been some amount of intentional propagandizing, of course. Mostly, this is just the natural progression from how we've arranged our labor and communities. Watch this video for more historical materialism in the context of COVID. So many of us do meaningless jobs for faceless overseers, somehow creating profit we never see for someone we've never met. We're alienated from our labor, from the monetary value generated from our labor, from that labor's effect on our communities, and from the individual people in our communities. Every store clerk you encounter is going to interact with you about the same as any other store clerk. Every waiter the same as any other waiter. Every dishwasher the same as any other dishwasher. We can't see these people as real human beings because they're not hired to be human beings. They're hired to be dishwashers or cooks or baristas. And that's the context in which we interact with them. We don't see these people as part of our community because we rarely see anyone as people separated from their labor. The first question most people ask a new person is, so what do you do for work? Our identities are so wrapped up in this thing that alienates us from our communities and ourselves that we start thinking, maybe our communities and ourselves aren't all that important after all. If you knew you would be guaranteed housing and food no matter what, because your community will provide these things, what would you do? Wouldn't you still want friends and relationships? Wouldn't you still want to work and help people in some way? Doesn't that sound like freedom? The freedom to actually choose how you want to spend your time? Humans do not survive on their own. We never have. Not anywhere in the world at any point in time. 
Seeing this pandemic as only about protecting communities or seeing it as only about protecting individuals are both limited frames of reference. You are your community, and your community wouldn't be the same without you. If you truly care about every member of your community, including the disabled people who have been and continue to be segregated and made invisible, including the newly disabled people who contracted long COVID, including future disabled people like yourself and everyone you love, then start acting like it. All right, this was a long one. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe if the spirit moves you. And you should probably also ring the bell for notifications because I upload pretty infrequently and the algorithm doesn't exactly love my content. All my sources and resources are in documents in the description. And be sure to check out my Disabled Creators playlist for other disability justice perspectives. I also have a Patreon and a coffee. Like, comment, subscribe, tweet, metaverse me some dogecoin i don't know D do whatever an extra special thank you to aaron anna esther veloz daddy james the lib eliazar daniel ariano flores grub child joseph dawes jr questing refuge sidekick turner bird and Ooseworm, and to all my other patreon supporters as well 